Well, good morning and welcome. I'm Nadia Siddiqui. I'm Chief Health Equity Officer at Texas Health Institute. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome you to today's national webinar on the Health Opportunity and Equity Initiative, or as we call it, the HOPE Initiative. We hope our time today will inspire hope and action toward achieving racial and health equity in our lifetime. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few housekeeping notes to ensure a smooth webinar. Uh, we will have time at the end of the session for Q&A. If you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A box at any time to get it into the queue. Should you need any technical support, please direct message Stephanie or Katie, who are part of our Texas Health Institute convenings team. Lastly, I would like to share that this session is being recorded. I want to just say how honored and pleased we are at Texas Health Institute to be hosting today's session alongside our respected partners and collaborators on the HOPE initiative. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan public health institute with the mission of advancing the health of all. We do so through our three strategies of producing evidence and ideas, translating and sharing insights, and advancing collaborative action. Health equity is at the heart and soul of what we do, and we could not be more grateful to be a part of such an important initiative. Uh, I'd like to, to acknowledge our partners and our funder. Um, this initiative is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It is a collaborative initiative led by the National Collaborative for Health Equity in partnership with Texas Health Institute and the VCU so Center on Society and Health. And I'm thrilled that all of our leads from the partnering institutes are able to join us today for this panel, including Dr. Gail Christopher, Executive Director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity, Dr. Dennis Andrulis, Senior Research Scientist at Texas Health Institute, and Dr. Derek Chapman, Interim Director of the VCU Center on Society and Health. And of course, we have to mention the trailblazer, Dr. Brian Smedley, who is the lead and founder of this initiative. We are so thrilled he is able to join us as keynote speaker today. And last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. David Williams, who uh, led and chaired our National Advisory Committee and all of our advisory committee members as well, who, was so, who were so instrumental to making this work possible. It is now um, my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Grail Christopher, who is an award-winning social change agent with expertise in the social determinants of health and well-being and in related public policies. She is known for her pioneering work to infuse holistic health and diversity concepts into public health sector programs and policy discourse. Dr. Christopher recently retired from her role as senior advisor and vice president at W.K. Kellogg Foundation, where she was the driving force behind the America Healing Initiative and of course, the truth, racial healing and transformation efforts that we'll hear more about. Dr. Christopher also served as Kellogg's Vice President for Program and Strategy and worked on place-based programming in New Orleans, New Mexico. In, two, in 2015, she received the Terrence Keenan Award from Grant Makers in Health. She chairs the board of the Trust for America's Health. And in, 19, in 2019, she became a senior scholar with George Mason University Center for Advancement of Wellbeing. Dr. Gail Christopher also became the executive director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity in 2019. And we have been just so grateful to partner with her on this important effort. Dr. Christopher, it is just an honor to introduce and welcome you. I will turn the virtual podium over to you now. Thank you, Nadia. It is my honor to be with all of you, the partners who made this happen. It is certainly a privilege and a pleasure. I'm gonna just set the stage a little bit, talk a little bit about the National Collaborative for Health Equity. Uh, we were privileged to partner with all of you. You know, our mission is to promote health equity and we do so by leveraging relevant data, by developing and supporting uh, community-based leaders, leaders in institutions, and also by fostering the policies and the practices that are needed to transform our society. Next slide, please. 
We have three basic areas of, of operation, three pillars that were embodied in our mission statement. Uh, we really do focus on, on leadership support because that's what it takes. It takes courage these days to stand up for the truth. Uh, we're also helping organizations and communities to really do the work, the accelerated work now on racial healing and, and striving for racial equity in a, in a pluralistic sense, bringing as many people to the table to stand up for these issues. And then ultimately, uh, we know that the research and the data that people need to drive decisions, it's so critical, but that data has to be framed in a way that it, it, it too promotes equity and fairness. And that's why we're so excited and proud of the HOPE initiative. We have several programs going on simultaneously, as most institutions do. Uh, the Culture of Health Leaders, which is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. This health initiative. Uh, we have community-based partnerships with collaboratives, cross-sector collaboratives working to, to support and promote and create health equity. Uh, we work with partners in the public health field as well to help them develop more capacity to achieve health equity. And then we are excited to be working on a policy initiative with the American Public Health Association and the De Beaumont Foundation to develop the scaffolding for healing through what we call policy or racial healing through policy. This brings me to the truth, racial healing and transformation framework. Uh, the strategy that Nadia referenced that we were so proud to be uh, instrumental in launching at, while at the WK Kellogg Foundation in partnerships with many foundations across this country. Uh, this is really an adaptation of the globally recognized truth and reconciliation concept uh, or transitional justice concept. Basically, we studied all the efforts that had happened around the world. We looked at the, the pros and the cons, the critiques, and we worked together with representatives of over 150 organizations to design a process that would be unique to our diversity in this country and unique to our 400 year history of building a society on the fallacy of racial hierarchy. So that framework, narrative change, racial healing and relationship building, are critical components of building a, a critical mass of people who care about these issues and are willing to stand up for them. We believe data is a part of the narrative change process. But we then asked ourselves, well, if this idea of a hierarchy of human value is simply not true, it is a fallacy, how has America managed to embed it and sustain it for consecutive centuries? And we recognize that there three primary pillars that undergird that practice. And one is, of course, separation. Everything from the cradle to prison pipeline to the residential segregation. So we know that separation is at the heart of maintaining the fallacy of racial hierarchy. We know that our legal system was designed from its inception to help reinforce these fallacies of racial hierarchy, our civil, our criminal justice, and our many of our public policies. And then ultimately, we know that our economies thrived and excelled based on this idea of exploiting many groups of people of color and the protracted enslavement and decimation of, of Native peoples. So these are the pillars or the tools of maintaining racial hierarchy. So we believe the work to undo that has to also parallel those, those pillars and tools. So we have to work on separation. We have to transform our policies. And we also have to create a just economy. And I am so excited that so much of the HOPE data parallels these areas of intervention. And it gives us data that can really give us hope to, to achieve equity, to achieve fairness, which is ultimately about jettisoning the fallacy of racial hierarchy and providing opportunities for equity for all people. It is my honor, particularly right now in these times, when we have more um, permission, it seems, to express hatred and division, when the pandemic has made us acutely aware of the societal inequities, this is the time for hope. And this is certainly the time for data that inspires that hope. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Brian Smedley. 
He is the chief of psychology and the public interest at the American Psychological Association. Uh, he is the co-founder and past executive director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity. And I was so privileged and pleased to be able to, to step into this role when he left, but we continue to partner. Most of us became aware of, of Dr. Smedley's genius and commitments to equity through the publication of the book, Unequal Treatment, over a decade ago. But he has had a career and a lifetime of fighting for equity and fairness and overcoming racism in our society. I would like to turn the mic over now, the, the virtual podium, as Nadia said, over to Dr. Smedley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Christopher. I so appreciate that. I was very thrilled when the team reached out to me to participate in this uh, very important webinar. So I, I first want to acknowledge and thank my partners. Nice to be reunited with uh, friends at the Texas Health Institute and the Virginia uh, Commonwealth University Center for Society and Health. I've enjoyed a long-standing uh, partnership with both THI and the Center for Society and Health. Uh, and I'm very grateful uh, for our partnership, which has resulted in uh, the HOPE initiative among many other efforts. I wanna say at the outset that I am uncomfortable being called the founder of HOPE. It was a total team effort as our team knows. So uh, my thanks to the team for many years of, of successful collaboration with this important initiative. Uh, Dr. Christopher, you said it right. Uh, we are at, a, at, a, at an inflection point for the nation. We are having a conversation about systemic racism. And while the circumstances uh, that have led us to this point have been tragic, including events like George Floyd's death last year, the COVID uh, pandemic, which is exposing the deep inequities that have been persistent in our nation for centuries, uh, I am encouraged that people are talking about systemic racism. There's a real hunger, a thirst to understand racism and how it operates. Even just the fact that we are talking in our national conversations about what this notion of systemic racism is, is encouraging to me. But I think we need to get on the same page about what in fact racism is. Dr. Kamara Jones, who we all know and admire, has defined racism as a system. Uh, so when we systemic racism, we are meaning the collection of racism operating at many levels. But Dr. Jones went on to say that racism is a, is a system that un, unfairly assigns value and allocates resources to some on the basis of superficial phenotypic characteristics, what we commonly associate with race. Uh, and so in the United States context, uh, the notion of white supremacy has undergird uh, many of our public policies, our laws, our customs, our cultural narratives. Uh, and so it's important to understand that we are, we have throughout our history assigned value to people of European descent, and we continue to do so today. But in doing this, uh, we unfairly advantage some, unfairly disadvantage others, and in, through that process, we waste human resources and potential. And it's, so that's something that our, our entire society needs to be concerned about. So I just offer that at the, at the outset to level set about what we're talking about when we talk about racism. Uh, I'm particularly encouraged because the HOPE initiative has taken an intentional look at structural and institutional forms of racism, which I'll elaborate on in, in this keynote. Uh, structural forms of racism are policies, practices, laws, customs, cultural narratives that have the effect of creating racial inequality. Uh, and these include policies and practices that we never corrected. Uh, and they include things like Jim Crow laws uh, and laws that enforced residential segregation through most of our nation's history. Uh, so we need to be clear that the fact that we have never corrected those injustices is a form of structural racism that persists today and deeply damages the health and well being of many people of color. We need to be looking at institutional forms of racism, policies and practices of institutions and systems that, while they may be facially neutral with respect to race, again, have the effect of compounding racial inequality. This includes aggressive policing practices in communities of color, uh, criminal justice uh, 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 systems where people of color uh, have worse outcomes at every step of the process for equivalent 
uh, crimes and, and, and misdemeanors. Institutional racism also includes uh, things like school disciplinary policies that result in disproportionate suspension and dropout of kids of color leading to the prison to, to in many cases, to the, to the school to prison pipeline that Dr. Christopher referenced. So these are, are some of the forms of racism that we need to focus our attention on. Interpersonal forms of racism, of course, persist. But if we are, as a nation, committed to undoing racism, we've got to be focused on those structural and institutional forms of racism. And again, you'll see some exciting examples this morning of how the HOPE initiative is measuring those structural and institutional forms of racism so that we can see them plainly, uh, so that we can correct them. All of us know that neighborhoods affect our health in many powerful ways. This slide builds on the work of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation commissioned to build a healthier America. So uh, what you see here is, is, uh, uh, is supported by mountains of research evidence, but it's also supported by what we see in every day uh, in our daily lives in terms of differences across communities. We know that healthy communities are those that are characterized by safe neighborhoods, safe schools, safe walking routes. In contrast, unhealthy neighborhoods are often unsafe even in daylight. Healthy communities have clean air, water and soil, clean environments. In contrast, unhealthy neighborhoods uh, have disproportionate exposure to toxic air, water and soil. Uh, healthy neighborhoods include well-equipped parks and open spaces, recreational facilities and organized community recreation. In contrast, uh, unhealthy neighborhoods have, have little of those characteristics. Healthy communities include high quality mixed income housing, both by race, ethnicity, and income, both owned and rental. Uh, in contrast, unhealthy neighborhoods are those with limited affordable housing, uh, and uh, often uh, these kinds of conditions are linked to high levels of crime and violence. Healthy neighborhoods include well-stocked uh, grocery stores, a strong retail food environment that offers nutritional options uh, that people can afford uh, and that they want to consume. In contrast, uh, neighborhoods that lack those characteristics, so-called food deserts, include uh, a heavy concentration of convenience stores, liquor stores, uh, uh, disproportionate tobacco and liquor advertising, and few grocery stores. In other words, vendors selling the very products that we know are unhealthy for people. Next slide, please. There's more. We know that healthy, uh, if you can go back to, to the previous slide, please. Thank you. Uh, healthy communities are those with clean streets that are easy to navigate, well-kept homes and tree-lined streets, organized communities, and nearby primary care offered in communities uh, with culturally appropriate services. And they include accessible, safe public transportation, walking and biking paths, ways for people to get where they need to go safely and efficiently. Unhealthy communities are characterized by the opposite of these conditions. Streets and sidewalks in disrepair, burned out, abandoned homes, uh, very few uh, culturally uh, sensitive community-based services, fewer uh, healthcare services available in communities, a point that again, the HOPE uh, measures uh, includes among uh, the, the metrics in the HOPE measures. We need to be measuring the allocation of our healthcare resources relative to community need. And unfortunately in the United States still today, there is a maldistribution of healthcare services relative to community need. All of these conditions are made worse by residential segregation. Residential segregation has been a feature of our nation uh, for the vast majority of our history. And though the, uh, the current laws, including the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 68 Fair Housing Act, prohibit deliberate racial discrimination in housing, segregation continues because of our laws, our policies, our customs, our practices that have persisted for 350 of the 400 years uh, that, that uh, this lands, uh, these lands have been populated, populated by new arrivals. So we know that segregation affects health in many ways. First, segregation determines, determines your socioeconomic status by affecting the quality of education and employment opportunities that are available to people in those communities. Segregation can also directly harm health by creating pathogenic neighborhood and, and housing conditions. So for example, when we see uh, a, a high level of lead in homes, uh, and we know that kids of color are disproportionately uh, exposed to lead in homes, this again is a direct threat to the health and well-being of those children. We know that conditions linked to segregation can also constrain the practice of healthy behaviors. Highly segregated communities are more likely to be food deserts. So 
uh, what is available to people who live in those neighborhoods. Disproportionately, folks are dependent on fast food, convenience stores, and other unhealthy uh, food products uh, for daily nutrition. And segregation can adversely affect access to medical care and high quality care. Again, this maldistribution of our healthcare resources relative to community need presents a significant problem that's to be expected given a market-based healthcare system, uh, but we should not accept this uh, as an ongoing reality. We need to ensure that healthcare services are, are available where they're needed and in, in culturally appropriate fashions. This form of medical apartheid, where we have separate and unequal healthcare systems, continues to this day and again is something that we need to be measuring and tracking so that we can correct those conditions. Next slide, please. It's also true that segregation affects our basic economic opportunities. That's why the health and opportunity uh, uh, initiative is important here because we're, we're measuring conditions for health as well as economic opportunity. So we know uh, that um, that segregation has has diminished uh, the, the capacity, particularly of, of black and brown uh, youth to get a high quality education and ultimately get high paying jobs. In fact, one study of the effects of segregation on young African-American adults found that the elimination of segregation would completely erase black white differences in earnings and income high school graduation rates and unemployment, uh, and would also significantly reduce racial differences in single motherhood by two thirds. These are powerful effects of neighborhood conditions on behaviors as well as opportunities to achieve and thrive. We have a myth in this country that people can choose to live where they would like to live and that people of color live next to each other simply because of choice. Well, this is a myth. Racial segregation arises from more than just the unintended consequences of economic forces. In fact, we know that governments at all levels, federal, state, and local, were complicit in efforts to systematically impose racial residential segregation. Again, throughout much of our nation's history, up until the uh, civil rights laws of the 1960s. Governments did, th did this through things like undisguised racial zoning, prohibiting people of color from living in majority white neighborhoods. By establishing public housing in already poor, highly segregated neighborhoods, rather than integrating public housing uh, into uh, more advantaged neighborhoods. Uh, governments created subsidies for builders to create whites only suburbs. This was a case in World War II, where there was a boom in building new uh, suburbs uh, uh, in, uh, in suburban communities to help find uh, housing for uh, soldiers returning from World War II. Overwhelmingly, uh, the soldiers that benefited from the GI Bill were white. Very few African-American uh, GIs returning from World War II uh, uh, had the opportunity to purchase a home in some of these newly emerging suburbs. Uh, and finally, governments were complicit, turning a blind eye uh, to violent resistance to integration of majority white neighborhoods. So these are all of the factors that led our government to help create the residential segregation that we see today. And we have never corrected that injustice. If we are serious about correcting injustice, this is the kind of uh, tragedy that we need to address. Why is segregation so important? We see the legacy of segregation persisting today because of course, not only did our government set up separate and unequal neighborhoods, but they also economically marginalized communities of color through practices such as redlining. We're all familiar with this concept. This is where the Federal Home Ownership Loan Corporation uh, uh, color-coded different neighborhoods to indicate which neighborhoods were safe to provide backing uh, for home mortgage loans. Uh, those neighborhoods that were deemed safe were color-coded in green or blue to indicate that they were safe investments uh, for federal backing of, of, of home loans. Those were also majority white communities. In contrast, those communities that were colored in red overwhelmingly segregated communities of color where mortgage loans were not to be backed, thereby squeezing economic uh, progress uh, and economic opportunity for those families that lived in those communities. The legacy of redlining persists today. Three out of four neighborhoods that were redlined on government maps 80 years ago continue to struggle economically today. Nearly two thirds of those neighborhoods deemed hazardous in the 1930s uh, are inhabited today by still mostly people of color. Cities with more of these neighborhoods have significantly greater economic inequality. 
On the other side, over 90% of those areas that were classified as best in the 1930s, those areas shaded in green, remain middle to upper income today, and 85% of them are still predominantly white. This is why we have the persistence of segregation today. It's true that people of color are overwhelmingly concentrated in high poverty census tracts. This is from research uh, that we produced a few years ago, uh, looking at the share of people from different racial and ethnic groups, white, African-American, Asian-American, American Indian, and Latinx in census tracts with different levels of poverty. Uh, those shaded in, in green, uh, are the share of residents in low poverty census tracts, that is those tracts with between zero and 20% poverty concentration. Uh, th those uh, shaded in gold are those, uh, the share of residents in medium poverty census tracts where between 20 and 30% of the residents uh, are below the poverty line. And those in blue are high poverty tracts with 30% or more below the poverty line. As you can see from the bar on the far left, about 90% of white Americans live in low to moderate poverty census tracts. In contrast, only about 55% of African Americans live in low to moderate tracts. 45% uh, live in medium or high poverty tracts. And similarly, you can see that Asian Americans, American Indians, and the Latinx population are disproportionately concentrated in medium and high poverty tracts. Now, you might say that this is to be expected given differences in income, wealth, et cetera. Well, we can control for that by just looking at those Latinx, African-American and white families living below the poverty line and seeing where they're distributed in terms of the poverty level of their census tracts. So we're looking here at poor black Latinx and white families to see where they live. As you can see from the set of bars on the far left, nearly 70% of poor white Americans live in census tracts with a low level of poverty concentration. Only about a third of poor African Americans are in those tracts and about 40% of poor Latinx families are in those tracts. Disproportionately, black and brown families are concentrated in medium and high poverty tracts. Why is that? Again, this is the legacy of residential segregation and our laws, policies, customs, and practices that concentrated people of color in poor communities while availing opportunities for even poor white families to live in low poverty census tracts makes a huge difference in terms of the health and well being and opportunities for those families in those uh, low poverty tracts. With all this evidence, we have plenty of science to point to directions where we need to be going to undo these conditions. We know that we need to focus on prevention, particularly the conditions in which people live, work, play, and study, looking at places as the lens through which we intervene. And we need multiple strat strategies across many sectors. These are not just problems for public health or healthcare systems to solve, but we need government agencies working across departments of transportation, energy, housing, uh, uh, education, uh, labor, et cetera, to work together to address the many social determinants of health uh, that are particularly consequential uh, for families of color. And finally, we need a sustained investment and a long-term policy agenda. As I indicated, it took centuries to create the conditions that we're seeing today. We're not gonna solve them in two years, four years of the next election cycle. So we need a sustained investment, a multi-generational strategy to undo the consequences of the policy decisions that were made uh, years ago, but are still being felt today. So the HOPE initiative beautifully addresses some of these challenges. It provides data and research that, that highlights the centrality of social determinants in producing health and opportunity. Too often in this country, we still think of health as a byproduct of what we eat or whether we go to see the doctor. Those are important, but we need to attend equally to the very conditions in which people live uh, so that we can intervene to create healthy conditions. Uh, HOPE also provides data that elevates the roles of place and race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, helping to uh, understand the many forces that create conditions uh, resulting in differences in health and health opportunity. HOPE also measures the social determinants that connect the concerns of diverse communities. So it's true uh, that there are rural communities that are predominantly white that are also high poverty communities that may share concerns about environmental quality or transportation or the quality of education. Uh, those communities through HOPE can also see where they may share concerns with communities of color that have been facing these kinds of conditions for generations. And HOPE also helps us to envision what is possible. 
by focusing us in a positive oriented direction with, with these measures, uh, we can see what progress we might envision through specific kinds of policy initiatives. So you'll hear more about uh, the great value of HOPE data to move us toward action uh, later this morning. I just wanna conclude with a quote that I like from the World Health Organization Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. Uh, they wrote in 2008 that inequities in health and avoidable health inequalities arise because of the circumstances in which people grow, live, work, and age, and the systems put in place to deal with illness. The conditions in which people live and die are in turn shaped by political, social, and economic forces. In other words, uh, the policy decisions that we have made, the ways that we have structured our society, our economic systems, these are the very things that are under our control to improve opportunities for health and wellness for all populations. And if we choose to do that, we will be a much stronger and healthier nation. Again, I wanna thank my, my friends and colleagues for asking me to join today. Thank you for this incredible work. Uh, and I hope all that are, are listening today will take advantage of this wonderful resource uh, so that we can move forward together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Smedley. We are so honored and um, informed by the details and the wisdom of your presentation. And of course, even though your humility is natural, we honor the guidance and the leadership you provided to get this HOPE initiative off the ground and to carry it through to completion in the critical ways that you have. So again, our heartfelt thanks and appreciation. It is my honor now to invite Dr. Dennis Andrulis, one of the partners, leader of the partner organization, the Texas Health Institute that we worked with to create the HOPE initiative. And he's going to tell us more specifically about the HOPE initiative. Dr. Andrulis. Thank you, Dr. Christopher. And I just want to echo Dr. Christopher's words, both for what she said in setting the context and, and what uh, Dr. Smedley um, presented on uh, really offering the opportunity to see the history uh, that has now become come at a time, our recognition of that history has come at a time when it's a pivotal moment uh, that also may pre present a unique opportunity. There's such a heightened awareness of inequities and, and their consequences now that are playing out from uh, from across the country, and I think what what uh, Dr. Smedley presented and that the context that uh, Dr. Christopher has presented uh, offer the opportunity to to kind of look broadly at where where we've been and and how we've ended up where we are now, and at the same time pointing the way uh, toward where we might go, and that we feel that that's something that hope might present. Uh, and offer to, uh, to folks around the country at the, at the local, state, and national level. So about the HOPE initiative. So HOPE provides what we feel, and you're gonna hear this kind of echoed throughout what the presentation today, it provides a new opportunity and approach and actionable data to help our nation and states move beyond measuring disparities to spurring action toward health equity. It really is meant to start a new conversation around health equity. It provides measures on social determinants of health to help leaders, advocates, practitioners set priorities and invest in broader economic, environmental, and healthcare conditions that are affecting health and well being. So it's a broad based uh, approach that is intended really to address specifically health and well being through recognizing the importance of measuring and taking action on social determinants. Now, a starting point, uh, Dr. Paula Bredman, who is part of our um, advisory group, national advisory group, offered the following uh, definition that we adhered to in, uh, in developing this uh, HOPE initiative, that, that it requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and consequences, uh, recognizes powerlessness and lack of access to, to good jobs, and a fair quality education, housing, safe environments, healthcare. <clears throat> really, uh, these embody the direction and the content and the vision of hope. Now, in this process, we were uh, uh, we created a website that was meant to inform um, uh, individuals. It provided the opportunity to, to have 27 indicators that are available for download 
on selected on, on indicators selected specifically to feature and link equity, health, and well-being, um, and uh, can be found at the, um, uh, the website www.hopeinitiative.org. But it's important to recognize that it's all formed the core around uh, around uh, equity, and um, to that extent, the measures are all. Um, are formed and created and selected for that purpose. So we were fortunate to have uh, a interest in the New England Journal of Medicine as uh, they came to feature hope-based infographics on their website and launching their race and medicine initiative to combat racism. And that can also be found on the New England Journal of Medicine. So uh, when, we, when we think of what are the points that distinguish hope, um, many of you are very familiar with long-standing valuable data-based resources such as the County Health Rankings and America's Health Rankings. Uh, we recognize that as well. In fact, uh, representatives from those uh, important resources were members of our, of our advisory group. But in putting together creating and furthering hope as we came to see it, there are four core elements that we feel distinguish it. And you'll see this reflected in the presentation that follows. But what, what, what they distinguish specifically are, the, first of all, to say that HOPE's vision, design, and work from its start through its web resources and findings were centered on equity. Equity was its starting point, its midpoint, and its point of where it is now. It, it, uh, it distinguishes it in the sense that equity was where we all began. Uh, many of these other websites in introduce and resources introduce equity as part. We started with equity at the core. Second, that while HOPE documents historic and current disparities and its primary focus is on identifying opportunities to advance health equity to inform and guide decision makers. So while disparities is represented, it's part and parcel and core in its own way to hope. At the same time, we have turned the, the work and turned the numbers, turned the measures and turned the purpose to look at the aspirational and positive ways in which we could use this uh, in a way to construct uh, effective ways to address disparities and uh, achieve equity and improve equity in our society. The third point is hope identifies goals that leading states have already achieved so that we are dealing with goals that are grounded in reality. So it's, there are ways in which in, the, in other measures have said, well, let's set these aspirational goals that are not necessarily reflected currently, but we feel is an appropriate endpoint. What we did was we found that there are states that have achieved certain levels of, of positive accomplishment and set those as the points of reference for other states as well. And finally, by identifying distances to goals that offer states a window into how far they are from leading states that have already achieved certain levels. So this distance to goal, hope goals, centered on equity and opportunity frame, create what we feel are the, the core value and contribution to, um, uh, to furthering uh, positive uh, responses and part of the, uh, positive policies and programs uh, for equity. So uh, in closing, I just want to raise a, just a couple of points here that, that this is a, a pivotal time in a lot of ways and prevent, uh, presents a unique opportunity out of tragedy, might very well offer the opportunity to, to act. Uh, COVID-19 exacerbated deeply entrenched racial and ethnic health equities. Um, I use the phrase, it's actually brought forth equities on steroids that you really see now. Uh, it's almost impossible to avoid uh, this, the uh, presence of inequities in our society. You know, it's from uh, uh, essential workers uh, through healthcare inequities, through distribution of vaccines. It's, it's present and, and documented. Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act offers a unique opportunity to reduce the distance as a goal for health, 
care, as well as child poverty, food insecurity, and other social determinants. It is a broad-based strike now uh, as the moment presents itself opportunity. And the Biden administration's strong focus on equity offers hope in, in not only the, the short term, but in the long term. It is their vision clearly as part of the administration to uh, address the inequities in our society. And then hope provides a data-driven starting point on, on this equity journey. It shifts the narrative to opportunity and what's possible. It helps create an understanding of the role and social determinants of health and it identifies similarities and differences in opportunity and health across racial and ethnic groups with implications for shaping programs and policies. And so uh, this, this kind of sets the, 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 uh, the ground, uh, the grounding, the foundation. And I'm gonna pass now the virtual baton over to Nadia Siddiqui. Uh, Nadia will, will discuss the hope measures and key findings in more detail. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrulis and Dr. Christopher and, and Smedley for, for laying the foundation and context for what I'm about to present in terms of HOPE's measures and its key findings. So what does HOPE measure? Well, HOPE includes 27 measures of overall health and the conditions for health that are modifiable by policy and action. These measures very closely align with other socio-ecological and social determinants of health models, including um, what Dr. Smedley cited earlier around the work of the World Health Organization. HOPE includes measures around broader health outcomes. So you'll see we have six broad health outcomes across the life course from infant mortality to child health status to adult health and mortality measures. There are six socioeconomic factors such as income, housing-related, uh, affordability, education, employment. Five community and safety factors, such as the opportunity people have to live in low poverty concentration neighborhoods and low crime areas. Four physical environment measures, such as measures of housing and food security, and six access to healthcare measures, including health insurance coverage, access to providers, having a usual source or dedicated healthcare provider, um, as well as proxy preventive me measures. Now, what you'll notice here is that very intentionally, we did not include health behaviors in our model. That is because too often, the disparities discussion gets caught in personal responsibility narratives. However, we recognize, and as Dr. Smedley pointed out, that deep and persistent inequities in health are produced by inequitable systems and conditions. And so even people's choices for healthy foods, physical activity, and other lifestyle choices are in fact dependent in large part on the opportunities that exist in the places where they live, learn, work, and play. And so what does HOPE tell us? Well, as I mentioned, HOPE includes 27 indicators of health outcomes and the social determinants of health. These data, if you go onto our website, as, as uh, Dr. Andrulis shared, um, the data are available in interactive format by race and ethnicity uh, for the nation in all 50 states. And then we also have comprehensive data available for additional analysis download um, by socioeconomic status, so income and education. And when you take all this data together, you know, what does it tell us? Well, there are four key points. First, it helps us identify equity gaps. Second, these data help set equity goals. Third, it helps us measure what it's going to take for our states and our communities to achieve those goals, so the distance to goals. And fourth, it provides data and information to drive action. So I'll walk through each of these in, in greater detail. So number one, HOPE helps our nation and states identify equity gaps. Well, what that means is it provides data to show how different racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups are faring on opportunity and health how wide these gaps are in opportunity and health for different groups, and which groups are more affected or will require resources and action according to need. Second, HOPE helps our nation and states set equity goals, what we call HOPE goals. As we mentioned early on, this is one of the unique features of the interactive um, uh, data. 
The HOPE goals are calculated by taking the average of the best rates achieved by top performing socioeconomic groups across top five states. These goals are achievable because we know those with the best opportunities have already achieved them in some parts of the country, as, as Dennis mentioned earlier. They are aspirational because most communities have a long way to go, and we'll see some data that really demonstrates this. In addition, and distinctly, these goals are not based on race. In other words, very intentionally, we did not base benchmarks off the performance of whites or any minority group, Asian Americans as a whole, who often perform better than others, so as not to reinforce the model minority myth. Instead, these benchmarks are based on education or income, factors that are modifiable in and of themselves. And finally, these goals can be applied at any geographic level to serve as benchmarks to monitor progress toward equity over time. Uh, there was a, a question in the Q&A that's starting to roll in around, well, how do we measure progress? How do we evaluate um, how we get there? And so as I go through the presentation, what we're doing is really providing a framework to understand inequities, set goals, to measure what it's going to take to get to those goals, so, so the distance to goals. And so it's very important um, to recognize that we don't stop with just presenting disparities data or creating um, benchmarks and goals. We provide a third critical point of data referred to as distance to goal or what progress will need to be made in terms of lives saved or opportunities improved to achieve these goals overall for each race ethnic group, as well as for each socioeconomic group. And then importantly, HOPE includes data that can help drive and inform equity action by illuminating where bright spots exist across states that are effectively closing equity gaps and encouraging us to learn to identify what are the policies, programs, and conditions that have enabled some states to close equity gaps and improve opportunity and health for all. And then inspiring then using that learning to inspire evidence-informed actions. So with that framing, I'm going to walk through now some of our key takeaways and the data that's included in the HOPE initiative. So our first key takeaway from the HOPE analysis was that HOPE portrays an America that would be dramatically different if everyone had fair and just opportunities to thrive. So if we were working to achieve the equity goals we've established, the HOPE goals, what would America look like? Here are some examples. 70 million more Americans would live in low poverty concentration neighborhoods. To put that into perspective, that is roughly the number of people who live in the southern region from Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. 55 million more adults would live in households with a livable income. 54 million more adults would achieve very good or excellent health. And 32 million more would have food security. But America's reality is much different. As our second key takeaway, what we've learned and what many of you already know, but these data really powerfully demonstrate, is the fact that opportunity and health vary profoundly by race and place. And so what you'll see displayed here is a sample measure. We have adult health status by state and race ethnicity. Adult health status is measured as the percentage of adults reporting their health as excellent or very good. Darker shades denote places that are performing well. In other words, they are closer to HOPE's equity goals. And lighter shades show places with poorer performance or those that are farther from the HOPE goals. And across much of the nation, what you'll see is that white and Asian Pacific Islander groups taken as a whole have better health outcomes than black, Hispanic, Native American, and multiracial population groups. Now, there are some exceptions. In fact, uh, places where even low-income white population groups are performing poorly. So if you take, you know, you can really see it starkly, um, the Appalachian region where white Americans in Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, and um, West Virginia fare poorly compared to, to whites nationwide. Um, so we've created conditions where not only people of color 
um, are, are struggling, but also our low income population groups. Here's another example of our current reality. And this is uh, income. And we define this as portion of adults living in households with an income greater than 250% of the federal poverty level, which we define as livable or you know, minimum sustainable income required for households. And it's fascinating to see how closely this display of maps mirrors what we just saw previously, mm -hmm. where in particular white and Asian Pacific Islander populations, again, taken as a whole, generally have higher rates of achieving a livable income than Black, Hispanic, Native American, and in many cases, multiracial population groups as well. And here's another uh, measure as well as an example. And this, this actually very nicely builds on what Dr. Smedley shared about low poverty concentration. Um, and so we measure it as portion of people living in neighborhoods with fewer than 20% of residents living in uh, poverty. And again, we see very similar patterns playing out but in particular, I want to point out how stark the inequities are between white and black Americans in terms of the opportunity they have to live in low poverty neighborhoods. You know, these findings reinforce what Dr. Smedley shared in terms of the generational impact that our history of racial residential segregation has had on people of color, in particular black Americans. Now, the third key takeaway here is that racial and ethnic groups who experience the greatest barriers to opportunity, um, such as housing, income, coverage, uh, other measures, are the ones who also face the poorest health outcomes. And we can, I've got five measures stacked up here. We can stack up all the measures in the HOPE initiative, and we'll find the same patterns playing out where it is predominantly our communities of color, Black, Hispanic, and Native American in particular, who uh, face the greatest barriers to basic life opportunities and also are the ones facing the poorest health outcomes. And while education helps, it does not eliminate racial inequities and opportunity and health. And we can use any socioeconomic measure, whether we're talking about income or other um, measures, while socioeconomic status an improved status helps, it does not eliminate racial inequities and opportunity in health. And um, this example actually, once again, picks very nicely up on what Dr. Smedley shared earlier. What we have graphed here are national data showing the portion of households living in a home that they own by race and ethnicity and college education. And there are a few very important takeaways. Number one, if you look across the board, at every level of education, even among those with less than a high school education, white Americans have the highest rate of home ownership. Number two, while many like to attribute this to merit and individual achievement, if you notice, even at the highest level of education, white Americans continue to have higher rates of home ownership than all other people of color. And in fact, households headed by black college graduate, black, Hispanic, and multiracial Americans have lower rates of owning a home than white Americans with less than a high school diploma. Again, I want to emphasize what Dr. Smedley mentioned earlier. These outcomes and home ownership are not by accident. They are by design. They are driven by a system that for decades and centuries, in fact, disadvantaged communities of color in particular black communities through a range of policies designed to keep America racially, uh, economically segregated. And this is important because as we heard, you know, there is a direct correlation between health and wealth and socioeconomic well-being. And as Dr. Williams shares, for every dollar of wealth that a white American has, blacks have six pennies and Hispanics have seven pennies of wealth. And these same patterns play out, whether we talk about social determinants of health or we talk about health outcomes. And so an example here um, is uh, infant mortality uh, by race, ethnicity. Again, these are national data plotted um, by education and race, ethnicity. At every level of education, infants born to black mothers experience a higher infant mortality rate. And while rates decline with higher levels of education, 
even among college graduate mothers, black infants have twice the mortality rate as all other infants. Again, there are forces far and beyond education, merit, socioeconomic, individual achievement at play. This is systemic racism at play right here. And so, you know, now that we have a better sense of the grim reality we're facing, how do we change it? What do we do? Well, that's the beauty of the HOPE initiative. It helps us imagine and it shows us what's possible. And what our data show is that every state can do more to improve the conditions for health and achieve greater equity. And so if we stick with the infant mortality example, currently in the United States, each year, roughly six infants will die for every 1,000 live births. And I will point out that we perform, I believe, almost at the bottom internationally compared to other high-income countries on this measure. Um, the HOPE goal is 2.5 infant deaths per 1,000 live births because we know that the top five states with the best outcomes have achieved this. Now, when you look to the right, what we've plotted here are our rates of infant mortality and how far each race ethnic group is within the top five leading states um, that are performing well on this measure and the bo bottom five states performing poorly on this measure. And as you'll see very consistently, Black and Native American infants in particular are farthest um, from the HOPE goal to reaching down to that goal. Now, if every state worked to achieve the HOPE goal through systemic and targeted action, 13,000 more infants would survive each year. And you'll see the donut chart provides a breakout of what this distance to goal is by race ethnicity. And so black and white infants in terms of numbers would really see the greatest impact, but we also know that all those other population groups will also benefit. So there's benefit to achieving equity, not just for those who experience inequities, but even for those who are thriving in this community um, and, and for, for majority populations as well. Here's another example. This is income. 62% of US adults live in households with a livable minimum sustainable income. The HOPE goal is 88%. Again, if you look to the right, you see how wide inequities are. Um, in the top five states, population groups are, are doing a little better than in the bottom five states. But again, every state has an opportunity to improve and really bring their population groups up to that hope goal rate of 88%. Um, if we really work to do that, say through minimum, minimum wage raises and increases, what we would be doing is improving opportunity, income opportunities for 55 million more Americans. And again, what's important to recognize is that yes, those facing the greatest inequities, in this case, um, American Indian, uh, Hispanic, uh, Black African American populations, um, even white Americans would benefit. In fact, 50% of the 55 million um, are white Americans. And then another example, I'll go through very quickly, low poverty concentration, since this was a, a theme that, that ran across um, our, our discussion today. 77% of uh, Americans live in neighborhoods with low poverty concentration. We know that there are communities um, across the state and top five states where 100% of all racial ethnic groups in fact, live in low poverty concentration. And so how do we get everyone across the United States to achieve this goal? If you'll see, we've got the top five states here where the inequities are, are much narrower compared to the top, uh, the bottom five states. Again, a very large distance to go if we work to improve uh, conditions within our neighborhoods. In fact, finally, I'll, I'll close by saying, you know, systemic investments to achieve HOPE goals can help all Americans while also closing longstanding racial and ethnic equity gaps. I think this is one of the most important findings um, demonstrated by this data that the work to advance equity is not just about people of color, it is about all of us. If we improve conditions, 
um, for all, we all benefit. And so let's take that neighborhood poverty concentration example, right? That big 70 million number that we've been talking about. Well, if we work toward achieving that, 29 million more white Americans would benefit, 19 million Hispanic, 18 million more Black, 2 million Asian and Pacific Islander groups, 1 million multiracial, and also nearly a million Native Americans would benefit from better opportunity-rich, low-poverty neighborhoods. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Derek Chapman to discuss the policy implications of HOPE. Great, thanks Nadia for that thorough walk through the, the HOPE framework, that was wonderful. Uh, I'll just point out briefly that I direct the VCU Center on Society and Health, which is an academic research center focused on raising awareness about the importance of factors outside of healthcare that shape health outcomes. So we do a lot of work on social determinants and as was the case with each of the HOPE partner organizations, uh, my center is committed to opening the doors of opportunity for all members of society in creating these partnerships that work across sectors to advance health equity. So today I'm going to briefly discuss how HOPE's data can inform federal and state action for health equity, and, and, and Nadia touched on a lot of this, so I'm just going to kind of reinforce uh, those points. So as been, has been discussed previously, HOPE provides a, a new way to frame and communicate equity priorities for bipartisan advocacy and policy change in a few major ways. Uh, first is that discussion about how we can shift that narrative from deficits and disparities uh, into this asset-based orientation that will replace measures that typically call attention to deficits rather than highlighting achievements or opportunities for improvement. So HOPE measures you know, income and not poverty and employment, not unemployment, housing quality, not housing problems. Um, secondly, HOPE data focuses on building opportunities for all to thrive um, we measure data, uh, national and state data by race, ethnicity, but also so socioeconomic measures that allow for a deeper understanding of health equity and, and opportunity for specific population groups. And then third, HOPE data shows what's possible for achieving equity in society. Again, we talked about those aspirational yet attainable goals for achieving equity uh, across health and broader well-being indicators. So uh, you can use those HOPE goals to set benchmarks to, that we know are reachable because they are based on actual rates we observe among certain populations. And then uh, again, it's also been mentioned a, a couple times, but you know, at the federal level, HOPE can be used to ensure, help ensure that funds are distributed in a manner that advances health and well-being for all. And that obvious example is the you know, almost $2 trillion American Rescue Plan Act, but uh, we know trillions more are being discussed currently uh, in infrastructure and other kinds of plans. So we really just need to ensure that as we build back, we, we do so in a manner that advances health equity. Now, this table shows the overall HOPE domain scores. Um, the top states in better scores are shaded in blue. The poor performing states in lower scores are in orange. And as a theme that's come up a couple of times in this talk is, you know, the states with the best health outcomes uh, didn't get there by chance. They, they tend to be the states that have successfully invested in social and economic community and safety areas, as well as healthcare factors. So, you know, for example, among the 12 states in the top quintile of best performers on HOPE's health outcome ratings, 11 of those 12 also have strong performance on at least two of the four social determinants of health, such as healthcare access, social and economic factors, and those community and safety factors. And five of the states in the top 12 have strong performance on three of the four social determinants of health measures. And then by contrast, those in the bottom quintile for health outcomes also tend to rank poorly on social determinants of health. Five of the 10 um, states in the bottom quintile have poor performance on at least three of the four social determinants of health measure. So based on our, our, our data across the, across the country, looking at all states, um, it was those healthcare access, social and economic factors, and community and safety measures that seem to be the strongest predictors of, of health in, at the state level. So HOPE data allows you to drill a little deeper into the state ranking. So we've been looking at a lot of national data, but you know, HOPE identifies common and distinct challenges faced by racial and ethnic groups, for example, to inform policy solutions. And when you look through these data, we, we identified three broad patterns of equity gaps um, as you look through the different conditions. And each of these types of gaps have different policy implications. So the first pattern shown here is, is our ideal situation, which is um, narrow gaps between groups, but where all people are faring relatively well. 
So examples of this include um, health insurance coverage and access to health care measures in Massachusetts and Hawaii, uh, as well as food security in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, in these examples, the policy implications are that, you know, we want to have continued monitoring of equity impact to ensure sustained success. Um, and then we still want to pursue program enhancements to continue closing the gaps that remain. This is relates to that theme we talked about uh, many times today of now, there's always room to, to be better. So everyone has, has room to improve. So we don't wanna you know, rest on our laurels and say, well, that's good enough. We wanna keep moving forward. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you um, a screenshot of the food security data um, from, our, uh, from New Jersey, uh, from our HOPE website. And you can see in this uh, slide that the rate for all racial and ethnic groups is pretty close to the goal, um, but there are still some gaps. So, you know, in terms of food security, security, for example, and thinking about policies, uh, the states that are closest to the hope goal of ensuring that 97% of residents live in communities with healthy food, and these include um, California, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, all of those states had adopted fresh food financing programs uh, as of 2015. And these are programs that provide fresh food retail projects, including supermarkets, small grocery stores, co-ops, farmers markets, et cetera, targeted directly to underserved communities. A second type of equity gap pattern is where there are narrow gaps, but where all people are faring poorly. So again, we don't wanna just eliminate gaps by having everyone do poorly. That's not the kind of um, narrowing of gaps we wanna do. And some examples of this include health insurance coverage and access to care measures um, in southern states, predominantly those without Medicaid expansion. So you'll see this in Texas, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and others. Now, when you see these kinds of uh, narrow gaps, but all persons um, faring relatively poorly, um, to address these types of gaps, states are going to need broad systemic policies and programs that will benefit all people. And on the next slide, we uh, show the health insurance coverage uh, in Texas by race and ethnicity. And you can see clear disparities with Hispanics uh, the farthest from the goal, um, but even the groups with the best rates, which uh, in, in Texas for this indicator are multiracial, Asian, and non-Hispanic white, even those groups are still pretty far from the whole goal of 98%. And then the third type of equity pattern is where there are very wide gaps, but some people are faring well and others are doing poorly. The most extreme example of this is homeownership, which varies eightfold nationally between groups where 81% where of uh, non-Hispanic whites in Delaware are homeowners versus 10% of non-Hispanic black residents in North Dakota. Um, but this also occurs in many other areas, including livable income and neighborhoods with low poverty concentrations. So in this situation, both broad systemic policies that impact all and tailored population specific programs are needed to address this type of equity gap. In the example from this situation, uh, I'm showing the low birth weight rate uh, in Mississippi by race and ethnicity. And we can see in Mississippi for a low birth weight, there are no groups that are close to the goal. Uh, but we also see that the black infants low birth weight rate is more than double the rate of the best performing groups. So in addition to showing that broad policies benefiting all uh, infants are needed here, uh, uh, these data clearly demonstrate the urgency of addressing the extremely high rate of low birth weight among black infants in particular. So in summary, HOPE provides a framework to help set a data-informed path to equity and accountability. HOPE can serve as an important catalyst to guide and drive meaningful and sustainable change by helping identify racial and health equity gaps, setting evidence-informed equity goals, measuring distance to go for achieving equity, and charting a path for equity action by building on the bright spots or states that are positive outliers or exhibit surprising data. So a quick example of this would be infant mortality in Washington state. You know, nationally, uh, as many of you are aware, uh, infant mortality among non-Hispanic black infants is much higher than non-Hispanic whites. But black infant mortality in Washington state is lower, um, 7.1 per thousand live births, than white infant mortality in Alabama, which is 7.3 per thousand. It also outperformed Hispanic infant mortality in South Dakota and infant mortality in Asia, among Asian and Pacific Islanders in Utah. So we have a lot to learn uh, from these unexpected findings. And, and these kinds of positive outliers raise questions about which contextual factors at the state level are driving outcomes that are different from national trends. 
And where we find these bright spots, we should scrutinize the social, economic, and environmental conditions in that particular state because it can offer important clues for policy change. Now, HOPE was designed and created uh, pre-COVID, but it is and remains very relevant to the pandemic, which has exposed for all to see how the intersection of racism and longstanding gaps and opportunity to thrive interact to amplify health inequities associated with the pandemic. Now, uh, as has been mentioned before, you know, typically these, uh, these longstanding gaps in, in, in racism have affected mortality rates over many years and leading to premature mortality and increased chronic disease rates. But, but now we're seeing these inequities resulting in disproportionate deaths among persons of color in real time every day on the news and online. So, so this is a, 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 a hopeful time in, in the sense that, that that has caught people's attention and we're finally having these discussions in, in public, public spaces and nationally and on the news, or we're having discussions of racial inequity and, and social determinants of health uh, and health equity. So. Uh, we hope that we can capitalize on this uh, national awareness uh, and understanding uh, to move forward. So HOPE data contain information on many of the factors driving the disparate COVID outcomes. Um, you know, consider that racial and ethnic groups most affected by COVID are less likely to live in neighborhoods with low rates of poverty. So social distancing can be more difficult in places with concentrated poverty. Household crowding might make it nearly impossible to isolate people infected with COVID from their families. Um, the uh, racial and ethnic groups affected by COVID also are less likely to earn a livable income, less likely to have health insurance coverage in the first place, um, less likely to have affordable housing. So in conclusion, the, the HOPE initiative provides an important starting point for federal and state leaders, advocates, and stakeholders as they work to address systemic inequities that impact not only COVID-19, but overall population health and well-being. So with that, I'd like to um, welcome back Nadia to facilitate the question and answer. And we'd like to hear from all of you. Thank you, Derek Chapman. And at this time, I would like to invite all of our panelists to join, join us back. And I will begin fielding the Q&A questions. Thank you all so much, particularly um, the attendees who have been so engaged uh, in the chat, but also the questions that we've been receiving. Uh, I'll start with a few of the technical questions we've received, and, and Derek, uh, I will direct these to you first. Um, let's start with a question from MD Anderson in the Houston area. How far can the data drill down to the community level? Will the data be available for region, county, or census tract level? Okay. Well, at this time, the data are at national and state level. The framework, however, is a can be applied to, to multiple areas. So we, we don't currently have um, sub state data uh, available on our website in our in our chart books. But like I said, the, the framework can can be modified to, uh, to, to, to to within state levels. Yes, and, and I would add in particular, you know, we've been in conversations with partners at the community level. Um, those that are leading cross-sector collaborative initiatives where this may provide an important framework um, for setting community goals, benchmarks, and then monitoring progress. Thank you for that. Um, the next question, there was another around um, here, uh, a question on earlier, I heard mention of Asian Pacific Islander data and model minority myth. Can you clarify what that point specifically was around the importance of disaggregating data on the Asian Pacific Islander community. Derek, would you like to take that or I'm happy to just maybe I'll start with you. Derek, would you like oh, to take yeah, that? Yeah, I can just start it. Yeah. So, I mean, really, it's this is really the challenge we face. And I think there's some other questions about other groups and asking why if we're hoping to expand to other population subgroups. So, so we think it's critically important to disaggregate data as much as possible to, to so we don't have any any group that gets kind of washed out in a in a in a, in a conglomeration. Um, the the challenge we find though with the data is just the data availability. So not all of the the sources of our data um, uh, are are collected at at those uh, different subgroup levels. So so um, we collected as many racial and ethnic subgroups as the data would support, and as many uh, socioeconomic subgroups as the data would support. 
So it really uh, points out to uh, a, a, a weakness. So one of, the, one of the policy recommendations is that we do a better job at, at collecting, uh, collecting national and state level data at, for, for different population subgroups. So we don't have to combine, um, you know, combine um, 15 different groups into a global Asian category. And, and we, we can look at different and in, in, in Hispanic and Latino can be, can be subdivided, for example. And we can look at LGBT Q um, um, populations and, and those types of other um, groups that um, who have really important and distinct health outcomes that, that we'd like to measure. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Christopher, I have a question here for you. Uh, understanding the inequities impacting mostly black and brown families, what are the solutions? Is the Evanston, Illinois reparative action the initial step? If so, what else is necessary? Well, you know, the driver, uh, you know, we talk about a web of causation when we think about social determinants of health. And some of the scholars in the field have, have asked the question, so who's weaving the web? You know, and we realize in America, as, as Dr. Smedley's presentation was so clear, it is this adherence to the belief in a hierarchy of human value this adherence to the, to the permission to have racists to continue policies and practices that were created uh, by racism, by the permission to devalue some people and dehumanize others. So I don't know that there is a the solution, but we know that one of the solutions is to collectively change our cultural ethos away from permission to allow racism to continue. And that's the intention of truth, racial healing and transformation. But we have to build a critical mass of public will. It was wonderful to see the outrage and the movement and the marching at the tragedy of the death of George Floyd. But we need that level to grow exponentially in this country in terms of refusal to accept the continuation and the persistence of racism as an ideology that undergirds our infrastructure and our policies and practices. This is a critical moment in our country. Once we make that shift, you could call it a paradigm shift, an ideology, a cultural and ethos shift, then we'll have an acceptance of the investments and the reinvestments that are necessary to create and sustain equity. Thank you for that, Dr. Christopher. Uh, Dr. Andrulis, I have a question for you. This is around income, particularly livable income. Do you have recommendations for livable income? Is it the $15 per hour minimum wage supported by the administration or something else? Well, I, I think this is a, uh, in some ways I see this as a, a, a circumstance in motion with regard to what's happening with inequities, with frontline workers, uh, with the um, with the movements that individual states are making with regard to livable income, uh, there may I, I think fifteen dollars is certainly a, a kind of a, a ground uh, a ground level uh, to to consider. But in terms of where states might go in the context of recognizing what the consequences of not having a livable income are for not just the individuals, but for, again, the essential workers, the frontline workers, the, the fabric of communities and the fabric of societies that, uh, that, I, that I think there's a, there's a good chance that there'll be um, a, a recognition and an elevation of the importance of not just considering, okay, we've reached a, a certain level, um, maybe that's it, our homework's done, but uh, First of all, to recognize that we have to raise that level. And second of all, that that may not be enough. So in terms of livable incomes, I think it's going to vary by state a bit, but, but there is a floor from which, uh, from which efforts should rise, not that the, the floor shouldn't be considered that's it. So uh, I think I, I take some heart from what some states have started to do but obviously this, there's so much more that needs to be done with regard to recognizing the consequences for us, as well as the, us meaning society, as well as individuals who are affected. Thank you. So I'm going to ask 
there are multiple questions around the youth application of hope. I'm going to pose these questions together and pose them to all of you uh, and, and all of us on the HOPE initiative team. So there's one question on how can we become involved with the HOPE initiative? The framework is stellar. Please discuss the methods we can use to evaluate progress. And there's another one around, um, you know, trying to understand the scope of the HOPE initiative. Does the HOPE initiative partner with academic institutions to gather drilled down data? Is the less granular data free? You know, does HOPE give grants to collect data or do they collaborate um, on, on grants for getting this kind of data? So several questions around use and application and I would open that up to our entire panel today uh, to respond to. I'll be happy to start it off. I'll, I'll, I'll start off on how involved. I've had a couple of conversations with, and I know uh, we at the Texas Health Institute have also had conversations about um, that hope has piqued the curiosity, the interest of foundations. Um, I've, uh, I've heard from a couple of, um, a couple of folks, certainly the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was, was foundational, <laughs> if I could use that term in getting us started and took a, a long-term uh, vested interest in what we did. So in terms of involvement, getting involved, I think that's one way to both consider who to partner with and who may be interested in and then look at support for, uh, for these efforts. Um, but getting involved through advocacy groups also, advocates have, have, have taken quite a bit of interest in this. Um, and uh, also looking at coalitions, folk, because we're covering, we're traversing a, a number of critical social determinant um, uh, measures and circumstances that there's an opportunity to, to, to cohere around them and then look to advance collectively as opposed to in a, in a siloed way. Thank you, Dr. Andrewis. Any any other additions to that panel? Nadia, I think it might be helpful if you spoke to the accessibility of the existing data through our interactive website. I mean, the question was, is this free? Uh, if you could speak to people's uh, capacity to access the existing data, I think that would be instructive. Absolutely, absolutely. So our website includes, as, as we shared, um, the data is all free um, for, for the nation, all 50 states for the measures we just shared. The interactive platform um, helps you really interact with data by race, ethnicity. All the socioeconomic data is available by download. Um, so this one was really the dashboard that we created focused on racial equity, but we have the socioeconomic equity data as well. And then all of the data files are available on the resources page um, for download. So the intent was um, really to get this rich data and information into the hands of those who can influence advanced policy change within your uh, state nationally, but also across communities. And I will also add, you know, the HOPE initiative, um, uh, we are looking to partner with others? Are there ways in which we can help you apply this framework at a community level? You know, we were funded by the foundation to focus on the nation and state, but very intentionally, we developed a design and framework that could be applied at a community level, knowing that health happens at a community level. So the framework is there um, and we're having early conversations, but certainly, looking to partner on the ground um, for how this gets applied at a community level to really begin to monitor and drive systems change um, at granular levels. There are, I'll, oh, there. Yeah, I'll also add that, that, that uh, and Dr. Christopher particularly would be interested to get your perspective on this. I've actually had a, uh, at least an exchange of correspondence with a congressional office, uh, okay. given the, uh, given the, the, presence of um, the word equity coming up now in conversations as well as 
uh, as a as a vision and driver of uh, within the Biden administration. I think that there may be opportunities among state representatives and at the federal level. Uh, hope and equity are one, you know, and the the fact that this administration has made equity uh, uh, a, a foundational element, a foundational uh, part of its vision, uh, I think may provide some um, national level as and even perhaps state level opportunities. Well, I, 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 that's exciting. And of course, we know that ultimately decisions about resource allocations are ultimately citizen decisions that drive elected officials and politics. So it gets into the work of the need to expand and increase the public will to support this kind of equity effort. Derek, I know at the center there, you all, the Center for Society and Health, you all do so much at a, at a more granular level with communities. I wondered if you could speak to what your sense of is the, the relationship between and the catalytic dynamic we have here between this state and national data and some of the more local uh, sources of data that might be available to communities. Yeah, and that was the, the good point that, uh, that we had, we were funded to do this national and state data, but often there's uh, richer data with, within states and, and thinking even of, of, of different, you know, different subgroups and categories, there may be better data collection in some states and more diverse population that have more diverse populations. So on, on that sense, I think the, the, the indicators can look a little different uh, at a within state uh, than, than, uh, than nationally, which kind of limited us in, in some ways. But we also um, utilize the um, we utilize these kinds of data uh, often um, as part of our kind of boots on the ground uh, active community and stakeholder engagement. So so this kind of kind of frames the broad picture. But then we go you know within a state we'll go in you know and, and look within a community and find out not just which communities are are are, are doing better or poorer, but then start looking at the the factors driving that and. Uh, and, and, and specifically developing action plans with the community residents themselves to find out um, uh, find out what's really important to them and, and how how to how to chart a path forward um, uh, uh, towards advancing equity. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, this was such an engaging and powerful session. I'm sad that our our 90 minutes are coming to a close, but as we do close. Um, I, I, once again, I, I, we're so grateful to all who was able to join us today, um, in particular our panelists um, and, and uh, you know, key trailblazers and leaders. Thank you so much for helping us imagine what's possible if we all worked collectively to create a more just and equitable America. Um, the window of opportunity, as so many of you have mentioned, for action on equity is now, and we hope the HOPE initiative provides a framing, a tool, and data to drive action. I would like to take a moment, if we go to the previous slide, to acknowledge our full HOPE teams across the partner organizations of the National Collaborative for Health Equity, Texas Health Institute, and the Virginia Commonwealth University the Center on Society and Health. Special acknowledgments um, to, to Dr. Smedley, Dr. Steve Wolf, who has, was instrumental to shaping the positive framing and approach of this work, um, as well as uh, all, all the members of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who were involved. And a big thank you to our THI convening team, team Stephanie, Katie, Megan, who really um, worked behind the scenes to make this all possible. Next slide. And we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge our full HOPE National Advisory Committee again, who were very instrumental to shaping the framework and positive aspirational but achievable aspect of what you saw um, presented here today. So with that, thank you once again for a powerful uh, discussion today as we all work to collectively create a more just society. Um, thank you to our participants for the engagement, for the questions, um, we look forward to staying engaged. I have my contact information here. Um, happy to field any follow-up questions, questions around use application, and I will work with our partners to ensure we get you responses. Um, as you log out, you will be prompted to complete a survey. We do value and look forward to your feedback. 
Um, and finally, a recording will be made available to all registered participants, and we will be posting the recording as well on our website. Thank you all so much for your time and um, have a wonderful day.